Uh, good afternoon, I'm Douglas Burnham. I'm the principal of Envelope Architecture and Design, and we're a 10-person design-focused firm. Uh, we used to be in Oakland, West Oakland, and we just moved to Berkeley. Um, part of um, Part of the project, I'm, I'm presenting Proxy today, which we actually are going to go um, after this to the beer garden. Today is the, um, the first day of Oktoberfest, so it could be very, very crowded at the beer garden, um, but it'll be worth it, I think. Um, but part of the uh, story of Proxy is actually um, based in, in kind of my personal experience um, being a professor of architecture at the California College of the Arts and also um, being the chair of the SF MoMA Architecture and Design Forum. It's these kind of other ways in which kind of being out in the world and, and having a um, having almost a mission of teaching, of teaching, uh, of teaching students architecture, of teaching design, but also teaching a kind of wider community about, about design and, and trying to educate uh, San Franciscans about why design matters. And that really plays into the, the story of, of Proxy and, and why we've done it. I actually need to get my uh, PowerPoint up. Um, I, um, so I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about Proxy. So Proxy is a project that um, we are wearing many, many hats on. Um, we are the architects, um, but we are also the quote unquote developer, we're the fundraiser, we're, um, we're the curator. We have done really everything um, with this project and it, and it really is, it really in a way has, has changed and is changing our office. Um, we, um, Proxy has been rec kind of widely recognized. We won um, the Architecture Foundation's um, Best Building in San Francisco in 2012, which when we go there, <laughs> you'll say, well, that's kind of crazy. Why would they, you know, the, there's, there's just, you know, there's not much here or there's just these little things. But I think it's, it's more about the strategy of proxy and um, about this idea of being able to transform urban space. And so people are very excited about it. Um, Proxy was also a part of um, and is currently a part of this year's U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. Uh, we're one of the lead projects there. Uh, Sarah Philly from Pop Up Hood spoke earlier and she also, was also a part of the Biennale. And uh, for the Biennale, we ended up doing a poster for Proxy, which actually explained the, the kind of bigger ideas of Proxy. And it's, it's almost a newspaper on one side, and it's a poster on the other side. And uh, we worked with a San Francisco graphic design firm called Manual, who's really fantastic. And so I have a stack over there and a stack over here. And you no pressure. You can take them. They're really cool and beautiful. But um, if you don't catch some of the things I go through, um, it explains a lot. Um, so. Proxy is, um, is a project that really started out of two separate disasters. Um, one was the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. Uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake damaged the, um, the central freeway, which is the kind of the 101 here. So we're actually right here. Um, and the central freeway was a double-decker freeway that uh, ran through Hayes Valley and uh, connected up Goff Street and fed uh, traffic up into the avenues uh, at, at this point. Proxy is about right here, and this is the center of Hayes Valley. Um, in, the, in the Loma Prieta earthquake, the it, uh, part of the double-decker freeway actually pancaked, and uh, the rest of it was deemed unsafe. And so over a series of, of many years, actually over a decade, uh, the um, first it was it was sort of shortened and a deck of it was taken off and then the neighborhood actually uh, put a petition together uh, um, and um, uh, had a public referendum and won the pu public referendum to have the freeway removed and a surface boulevard created. 
So you probably can't see this uh, very well, but um, we're here, and this is Market Street, and Hayes Valley kind of as a, as a center is right about here. Um, our project proxy is right here. So this is Hayes Street, and this is Octavia, and that's Market. And what happened um, when the freeway was removed and then the surface boulevard was created is that there was a series of lots that were created that were the strangest shape and size lots. Most of them are kind of crazy, crazy lots. And uh, they start um, all the way up here at um, Goff Street as with an A. Uh, and they're lettered all the way down until you hit Hayes, where this is K, which is part of proxy, and so is L as part of proxy. And then all the way down to V here, which is a building that uh, actually just got approved that Stanley Sato has designed um, right at the head of Octavia at Market and Octavia. And um, we got involved in this neighborhood because we, um, we were part of the 2005 San Francisco Prize and we won first place for um, a, a multifamily housing project on these two lots. So this is Proxy at K and L and this is M and N. And these are lots that are 18 feet deep uh, and 120 feet long and five stories tall. So they're basically like a facade almost that you can inhabit. Um, and so we won first place for that. And then two years later, we uh, won the right, we put together a development team ourselves and won the right through the mayor's office to develop those properties. And um, we went all the way to submit for permit um, two days after Lehman Brothers collapsed. And um, at the time, we had no idea what the implication of that would be. But about six months later, we were on the doorstep of the mayor's office, um, who is the kind of, who basically, the mayor's office in San Francisco got kind of control of these vacant lots and, and was the kind of steward of them. Um, when Caltrans gave the land to the city. And so we went to the mayor's office, the mayor's office of economic development, and we said, we need to put our project on hold. The, you know, no one, there's no, no one can get a mortgage, no one's doing housing. Property values for vacant land have just dropped precipitously. You know, we need to, we need to just put it on ice. So they said, no problem. All the other firms that have come to come forward uh, for, that were doing projects on these sites have said the same thing. But you know, if you could come up with an idea for any kind of temporary use, the neighbors are really getting upset that nothing is happening on these lots. And you know, any, it could be any of the lots. It could be your lots, m &N, it could be any of them. You know, just come back to us with a proposal and, you know, and we'll see what happens. And so that's how Proxy began. Uh, it was essentially an informal uh, conversation uh, in the mayor's office. And um, I took that back to our, our office. And in a way, you know, when I left the meeting, it was, it was actually a little bit insulting, perhaps, because they were saying, oh, well, you know, could you do something? But they didn't have any money. There was no money. There were no grants. There was no money. And, um, you know, they were basically asking for free work. But, took it back to the office and everyone started to get really excited about it. And um, it was something that we realized that we had a really strong network that we had built up over doing a kind of diverse body of work that we kind of knew people in San Francisco and we also knew and loved San Francisco. And we started to hypothesize about what, what the possibilities um, of, of temporary uses um, on kind of vacant lots could be. So this is, this is K and Al just zooming in a little bit. So this is Hayes Street and this is Octavia and we're all the way down here. Um, this is a new park that was created. It's called Patricia's Green and it was created when Octavia Boulevard was created. So most, most traffic comes down here and it turns up fell and then this is this kind of pedestrian park and this is the kind of neighborhood commercial district of Hayes Valley. So, Lot K is right on this neighborhood commercial kind of strip, 
and lot L um, is, is pulled back a little bit, but it's also, they both front on the, on the park. And so we saw enormous potential with these two lots that other lots had come forward, other people had come forward with farms, uh, ideas for farms on, on several lots. And this was kind of simultaneous to this conversation with the mayor's office. Uh, but we thought that K and L, because they were adjacent to a park and because they were connected to a kind of uh, a, a pretty strong uh, neighborhood commercial district, that they really needed other uses other than a kind of farm use. And so we thought um, through that, and it was really the motivation for the, for the project. Um, so this is uh, the, a before picture. This is lot uh, L, which is where the beer garden is. And this is lot K, which is where uh, Smitten ice cream, uh, ritual coffee, and a whole slew of other things that are coming forward um, are and will be. So I'm going to step maybe w way, way back and, and look at our kind of our precedents or our kind of um, conceptual kind of motivations for the project. And um, this is a project called The Instant City by Archigram. This is a project that they thought, um, thought, thought of and presented in 1969. And the idea of The Instant City is that um, a, um, a kind of um, dirigibles and trucks and um, m many forms of transportation would come and bring culture to um, small and medium-sized cities across Britain. And what they would do is, is it was sort of the it was the beginning it was the advent of of this sort of global culture the, and the, the the term global village was was really um kind of beginning at that time and it was it was um trying to connect these kind of rural communities back to the city and kind of city culture and what was happening with kind of new media uh art uh practice and and design and so this, this kind of mobile idea that, that kind of content can be delivered um, through kind of multiple means. And so this is an inhabitation of, of a beach. And so there's, there's balloons and kind of tents and kind of uh, billboard things happening here. And this whole beach here has kind of many events, maybe something like a Burning Man kind of thing. Um, and this diagram is, is, uh, was really important to us in kind of thinking through this idea of temporary, like what, well, what, what can you do with temporary? Um, and so here's a diagram from, from one to four, um, where this is what it says here, typical larger provincial town. Um, and what happens is they start to bring, uh, this is the, the IC is the instant city is coming. Uh, they, they basically bring to cinemas and schools and kind of public spaces this kind of technological kind of infrastructure, media kind of technological infrastructure. And um, they, they basically have what, what they call um, a national happening network, which is, sounds really great. Um, and so there's lots of kind of media things that are happening. And then the, the, the instant city moves on, but it leaves a kind of trace. It actually changes the place that it, um, that it inhabited. Um, so that was an important thing. And another one, uh, kind of contemporaries of Archigram is Super Studio. And this is this, um, um, this idea, one, one of many ideas of Super Studio, of the super surface, and um, it's really a kind of prefiguring the internet. Um, this uh, young woman is basically connected to a, a t kind of technological grid that goes on uh, for, to infinity. Um, and the idea of, of Super Studio is that we were, we were all kind of connected uh, by this kind of inf information kind of grid. Um, and in a way, they, they were arguing for the dissolution of architecture itself, um, that we can become kind of nomads in this kind of uh, information kind of landscape. And another part of uh, Super Studio, because they're Italians, uh, is that there's a little bit of a kind of hedonistic, maybe 60s kind of counterculture edge. And so um, when we were thinking about um, the kind of programming of, um, of proxy. This kind of uh, Northern California kind of um, uh, um, appreciation for wine and good food 
um, was, was kind of a part of it, actually kind of having fun and having fun kind of out in the world together. And so when we were thinking about um, proxy, the, the kind of not really right at the beginning, actually more when we, um, when, when things started to actually, when the project actually started to become more real, we, we conceived a proxy as what we call a content machine. And that, that it is in a way a kind of physicalization uh, of, the, um, of the internet. And so, you know, every day we are looking at our, at our technological devices and we are, we are constantly receiving content through these, these interfaces. But architecture doesn't really exist at that scale. Things don't really change that quickly within architecture or even within the city. And that the city is, even though, so this is, this is a, this amazing urban mapper. This is San Francisco, uh, the East Bay, the Bay Bridge, um, and the Golden Gate Bridge. This is Eric Fisher. Eric Fisher is a local uh, urban cartographer. And he's data mapping uh, all the Twitter posts in, on a certain day uh, coming from uh, San Francisco. And so this is this kind of other world that is now kind of existing simultaneously to the kind of the physical construct of the city. And so here's another one. This one's called um, uh, Tourists and Locals. Uh, and so the blue are the locals and the yellow are the tourists. Um, and so these are the kind of paths of self, uh, self-described uh, different people. So we live in these kind of data constructs. This is the AT&T coverage map, which is really kind of great because uh, where proxy is, which oh, I'm not seeing it, it's right there, I think. It's a red, red dot, um, This means there's no coverage, which is still true. Um, but we, 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 you know, we live in this world, but the city is really not necessarily, the city, the kind of physical built city, the, the city that architects have built, um, is, is not necessarily a part or affected by that, although we all, we all are. So this, this kind of idea of the content machine, I think proxy has yet to, to live up to that potential, but we, um, we have pieces that are coming online. Uh, that will do that, but this is a kind of way in which we kind of both got to that idea and kind of are, are trying to make that idea real. Um, so this is actually what we presented back to the mayor's office after they came to us and asked for, um, for ideas for temporary uses. We actually came with a very simple menu of, um, of different content types, arts and entertainment, uh, retail, community spaces, which could be kind of meeting rooms um, or uh, modular furniture or farmer's markets. Food was a really, really big component. So um, um, food trucks and food carts and ice cream vendors. Um, but also um, an important part for us was maybe some rooted, uh, rooted restaurants and things like that. And then the, a, a pop-up retail component and then an arts uh, and entertainment component. So this is literally, this is the front page of what we presented to them. And they, um, they said, that is great. Um, keep going. We love your work. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens next meeting. So all the time we're working for free. Um, and um, so we started uh, to develop those ideas. And so this idea of temporary in food, social event, art, and retail and brand. And so we're just hypothesizing about these kind of what, other, what are the other kind of precedents out there. So uh, gelato. Um, a, a hot dog cart. This is actually an American hot dog cart in Amsterdam, which is really great. Um, kind of open food vendors, you know, Asian street food is a really kind of uh, fantastic, kind of vibrant experience. Um, also kind of Italian markets. Um, there's a bunch of people that have these mobile pizza ovens in the Bay Area. Uh, that one's this one's in Brooklyn. Farmers markets. That's actually Pike Place uh, in Seattle, which is this fantastic thing. Uh, moving into this kind of social event 
um, category. Um, this is Dolores Park, uh, which is a kind of beloved park in the Mission in San Francisco, and outdoor movies happening kind of in the public realm for free. Um, you know, temporary stages uh, for music events or temporary stages for um, for fashion shows. And then this, there's this kind of new idea, uh, kind of European idea, of this kind of modular mobile furniture, and that that furniture can start to create social space, and kind of it can be redeployable, and people can move them around. This is at the Museum's Quartier in uh, Vienna, and it's actually a quasi-public space. Um, it's an interior, very, very large interior public courtyard, and they use these for different kind of programming events. Here's the detail of that. Um, and then, of course, the High Line in New York was a pretty major um, uh, precedent for us. It was kind of just coming online when we were working on the project. And how the High Line actually kind of looks at the city it's, and um, creates opportunities for sitting and kind of uh, looking at people and looking at, um, looking at back at the city. Um, and then there's a project called Platoon um, in um, Berlin, which is also important to us, where they actually create a kind of club in a kind of social space around a pool and a couple containers. Um, and this is a project that a, a developer actually put together on a project that was stalled in Berlin, uh, in the former East Berlin. Um, this is PS1, the Urban Beach uh, project by Shop Architects. Um, and so these kind of design installations that create space and that actually celebrate design and the power of design in, in creating space. Um, and then art, that art, uh, art in the public realm doesn't have to be sculptures, but it can be kind of media or kind of infrastructural. Uh, this is Barbara Kruger. She's kind of doing her uh, text thing on uh, containers in New York. Um, or even projections. This is a project by Doug Aiken, the artist Doug Aiken, uh, at MoMA in New York, where he projected, it's called Sleepwalkers, and he projected a whole series of uh, videos onto the outside surface of New York MoMA. So video projections can be a kind of public art kind of piece. And then um, everyone's heard of pop-ups, so retail brand things. This is Uniqlo's um, container in New York that they drop. Um, and then these, this is a, in an art gallery, a kind of pop-up store uh, by Citizen Citizen, um, who's a design uh, savvy retailer. Uh, this is Comme de Garçon, did a retail pop-up. Uh, and then Levi's does this really great thing um, where they have a kind of photo studio and a graphic design printing space, but they align their brand with that. And so it's a kind of teaching space um, that um, is kind of brand driven. And so we took these ideas of social, event, art, food, and retail brand, and we saw these as kind of intertwined pieces that in order to kind of drive vibrancy, to, to drive a kind of vibrant experience in, in, in creating a place, that you really needed um, a, the, a kind of mixture of these together, that it wasn't just one, that just having food, say, kind of isn't enough, you actually need other things happening. You need art, you need events, you need kind of retail brand. That the kind of multiplicity, the heterogeneity that, that, that we all love about cities um, is, is about this kind of mixture. Um, and so we kind of reforge those into our brand, uh, proxy, proxy event play, proxy art, proxy eat, and proxy storefront. So I'm gonna go through those pieces a little bit. Um, this is an ideogram of the project, and um, it's probably hard to understand, but you can see basically these words are kind of being deployed across these, the two sites, um, but I'll start uh, from phase zero. So phase zero is um, these were vacant lots. Um, the idea uh, or the kind of the framework or the ground rules for the project was that it had to be temporary, that, the, that these lots are destined to be multifamily housing, that um, lot L will be a market rate housing project, um, and lot K will be a redevelopment agency project, even though now that doesn't exist anymore in California. Um, and so that would be a below market rate housing. Um, so this is lot K 
the redevelopment agency site and lot L, the, um, the market rate site. So the, the, the kind of what the mayor's office ended up offering us is not money to develop the design or grants, but a, a rent equivalent to what they were getting for parking on lot K. Um, and so we pay a fairly low rent, but it's still money. Um, and we have a five-year lease with the city. And so there's a timeline, it sort of starts, and then we basically can do what we want with it within planning and building department uh, limitations. Um, so we thought that we really needed to begin with food, that food would really drive people to come to the site, that, that people kind of coming together around food um, is a kind of primal thing. Um, and it would get people kind of um, interacting with the site. And so this first, so this is now phase two. Phase one uh, was, um, I'm gonna go back. Phase one was this piece here. So situating everyone, this is Octavia uh, Boulevard and this is Patricia's Green here. This is Hayes uh, Street, I can, it still holds. This is Hayes. There's a little alley called Linden Alley and uh, Blue Bottle Coffee is right there. Uh, and this is Fell, which is a major uh, connecting street in San Francisco. Um, we started with uh, phase one, which is the food garden, uh, which really is kind of smitten ice cream and ritual coffee. And we've had a couple fits and starts with other, other vendors. Um, and we've also had a number of um, food trucks that have uh, been operating on the site through off the grid. Uh, phase two was the beer garden, which really was the first, it's the thing that really drove a lot of people to the site and has created a kind of huge uh, buzz. Um, the beer garden is uh, run by Zuppenkuka, which is a neighborhood German restaurant. And it essentially it's, they look at it like it's their terrace. They're not like right next door to the site. They're uh, about a block and a half away. Um, but it's, um, it, it's a really uh, powerful social space in the city now. The third piece is an art gallery. So we're kind of driving this, this art um, idea. Um, and we've, in the meantime, have had, so we're basically at phase two. We're trying to complete phase two, but now we're simultaneously working on these kind of other phases. So when we go there, the beer garden's there, the kind of first food garden piece is there, maybe you know 70% complete. Um, the art gallery is a piece that we have convinced a client of ours who is a contemporary art collector to actually fund the building. And I'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's a demountable um, temporary building, meaning it is panelized and it can bolt together and come apart. Um, and they would own the building. And so they can, after our lease, they can redeploy that building anywhere in the city um, that they would like. And then the last piece, which is actually has two components, is um, a proxy storefront, which actually wraps the corner of Octavia and uh, Hayes. And then proxy event play, which actually happens in the middle, in the courtyard space that's created by, um, by doing these kind of pop-up pieces. So this is a night view of it. And you know, we, I think we always took these views as a, with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, we don't literally think that they will all happen exactly um, you know, how this is showing. Um, but we really needed compelling images, compelling renderings to articulate the whole vision of the project. And so this is to, to the mayor's office, to the board of supervisors, to the neighborhood. We've had, I think I, over the course of this project, just not the M&N project, but just for proxy, I've met with the neighborhood in an official capacity probably seven times and in an informal capacity probably 20 or 30 times that we have a kind of constant relationship with the neighborhood. So our, you, we've used these kind of renderings as ways to show our intention and then when they actually come true, everyone's kind of amazed, um, but it's, it's kind of great. So um, this is proxy today. It's actually proxy last fall. Um, the, what's not there now is this piece, which is the Museum of Craft and Design, had a series of, uh, of short-term installations there, and I'll get into that later. Um, but um, 
this is Octavia again. This is where Ritual and Smitten is, and the beer garden is kind of down here. So looking at Proxy Eat, um, this was one of the original uh, renderings for the corner where Smitten, Smitten Ice Cream is, and it's showing the kind of the whole project kind of built out. This is Linden Alley, and this is Octavia Boulevard. And this is actually Smitten Ice Cream um, in, uh, uh, in reality, it's actually we've built since that time a uh, kind of uh, four season porch that has panels that can be removed in the summer and fall and kind of uh, they can serve ice cream in the winter. So there's now a kind of framework structure in front of this. And then um, ritual is back there. So there's this, I don't know if you can really tell, but there's this kind of sense of these things is, um, were in the renderings that were kind of forecasting and communicating to the neighborhood what these things will be. This is Ritual Coffee. So these containers, you know, a lot of people talk about the project or got excited about the project because of the container story. And for us, the containers are just another way to efficiently house content. And a lot of what we do is to dissolve um, the kind of container qualities in some ways. We, we actually love containers. We have a Flickr site and it's all container porn. It is just, you know, like cutting into containers and close-ups of containers and, and you know, how do you do this? It's actually a very much a kind of, on our Flickr site, very much a how-to of how, kind of how to do these things uh, with insulating them and how do you do it? How do you run the utilities? How do you get uh, handicap access to them? Um, but what we have tried to do is really open these things up so that they are reduced pretty much to frame. Um, and so it means we've actually had to structurally reinforce them. So here there's a, there's a beam up here that's hidden in. It's actually a little moment frame. And this is a, the, the solid part of the container actually exists there and there to stiffen this thing so it doesn't uh, twist. Um, but at the end, um, it has a big glass panel. So it's really reading as frame, and so that is a big glass panel at the very end, so people can see in. And then this whole side opens up, which is the customer interface. Ritual is the same. The beer garden operates in kind of different ways. This is from within the container looking out, and you can see it basically kind of dissolves away. Um, this is a, hard, a very hard to see rendering of the beer garden. Uh, but again, kind of similar tactics, different, um, different door types, but these are sliding doors. Um, but the idea here is that there's a beer container and a food container, and the beer container just kind of opens up, and there are the taps, and they're kind of open for business. And um, when you go by there in the morning, they don't open until 3, and they're, they're uh, open, I think, Wednesday through Sunday. When you go by when they're not open, it looks like nothing's there, which is in a way kind of great. It has so little impact, it's almost invisible. When, it, when they open the doors and they bring out the tables, it is a, just a convivial, kind of vibrant space. And so that being able to have something that exists between this kind of state of invisibility and then this state of kind of convivial, kind of you know, a very kind of strong, compelling space that people want to be in is for us, for us a huge success of this kind of work. It's not necessarily what it looks like, but it's how it performs. Um, and so that's how we think about it. This is really hard to see, but maybe we'll get to go there. Um, we planted one enormous tree in the middle and had it trucked in. So it was kind of the beginning of the garden. All of these projects are on a budget. And we had to come up with a kind of economic model by which um, we kind of made it up. I mean, we became, we had to, the city said, okay, go. And the, the, the Board of Supervisors said, okay, you can have a lease. And the neighborhood's like, great, when can it be done? But we had to figure out how to do it. Like, how do you do this thing? And no one had really done it before, and no one had gotten building building permits for it, um, in, at least in San Francisco. I mean, the Europeans have been doing these great little containers for a while. The Dutch and the Germans have been doing them. Uh, and so you see them, it's like, oh, it's doable, but how does it happen? And it's different when you're doing it. So 
the economic model, at least for the, the rooted vendors for the EAT part, is that we, um, we're designing the containers for our vendors, and they're paying us. They own the containers. We help them get them fabricated. And um, this kind of the design build question that was uh, put to the panel before, in a way, we're doing design build with these. We've basically taken out the general contractor out of the loop. We're supervising the construction, but all of the contracts go directly with the client. And so it's not really design build. It's this kind of hybridized kind of limbo thing because we have to build them incredibly cheaply. And, and uh, we tell our clients, the, our vendors, the ground rules, and they agree that, that's, that they're happy with that and they understand the implication of that. And then it's, it's almost just a slightly more intensive construction administration process for us. Uh, but we're using all, all vendors um, that we know and trust, and so um, that is what makes it work. This is a diagram of a piece that we're trying to do with Whole Foods and it's this idea of a content machine. And um, we're, uh, San Francisco is such a great food town that we're trying to do a rotating chef container, which would basically be a rooted kitchen um, that would have different um, chefs that would kind of cycle through on a week or a kind of two week basis. And these would be kind of, uh, young, maybe young kind of hotshot chefs that are working in other people's kitchens, or it could be people that are being trained through a, a, a kind of training program like La Cocina, which is a really important um, training program in the mission in San Francisco. And so it, it would give these young chefs a way to kind of try out whether they can do a kind of restaurant uh, out in the world. So we're trying, Whole Foods is interested in sponsoring it. They would be kind of behind it, but no big branding on it. And we'll see whether that happens. Uh, Proxy Art um, has come forward in a couple ways. We um, were able to convince a, a British graffiti artist named Ben Ein to do this enormous graffiti here. Um, he is known for doing kind of wordplay um, pieces, and it is the it is the backdrop for a proxy. And uh, it may be hard to tell what it says, but it says brighter, faster. And so he, um, he he always does these kind of wordplay things. And we were very we were not in control of what words he put up. We were very happy with brighter, faster because it's really the ideas of of proxy. Um, Another piece that we've done is that the Museum of Craft and Design is a local design craft uh, museum that lost its lease several years ago and had been doing pop-ups in storefronts. And they were looking for the next thing and they heard about our art gallery and they're like, when will it be done, when, when will it be done? And we're like, it won't be done yet. We're thinking, you know, maybe spring of 2013. And they're like, oh, that won't work for us. But they came back and uh, wanted to do installations right out in the open. So we came up with, uh, a, as a way to do this, we designed for them pro bono a, uh, a, a store, which this is just the outside of the store, but it's basically a kind of base for them. And uh, there were three artists that had installation, month-long installations. This one is by Andy Vogt, uh, which, where he used lath and connected to the, um, the cyclone fence this kind of viewing apparatus to look, kind of be in, in the space and look out at the sidewalk and to also kind of be the other way. Um, and then this uh, was the, the final project by Future Cities Lab. And Future Cities Lab is a, uh, they're friends of mine, they're professors at CCA, uh, Natalie Gatenio and Jason Kelly Johnson. And um, they do a lot of installation work. And so uh, this is a piece they call Trillix, which uh, was also made out of lath, although new lath. And they were basically pavilions that you could go into. Uh, and the inside had a kind of fluorescent orange paint on it that was iridescent. So at night, it would glow. Um, and so this is the kind of opening event. And, and it framed the sky in a really beautiful way. So this kind of bringing public art to, to the space, to the city, it really creates this kind of a kind of place where where people really want to be in what was just a kind of empty parking lot. Um, this is the art gallery, and so we're working on this right now. The idea is to try to get it uh, up by 
either spring or early summer of uh, 2013. Um, and um, I spoke about it before, so I, I won't go into it. But the idea is that it's, it's panelized. Um, it's, a, it's a space that is open to Linden Alley, which faces north. Um, and uh, has doors that can completely open up or completely close down. Um, and this piece would be owned by our, our client patron and would then um, would be able to go away after our lease is up. And so I think the power of that is that proxy as a strategy then starts moving beyond the site of proxy. It goes beyond Hayes Valley. and. And now we're actually thinking about that. If I have time at the end, I'll talk about how we're thinking of creating an organization, essentially, that does what we're trying, what we've done at Proxy or what we're working on at Proxy. So again, back to the kind of content diagram, uh, content would change in, on quarters. Uh, there would be new exhibitions, and we would align with either different artists or different curators or, um, or, or uh, different um, arts institutions. Then proxy storefront is, uh, we call it storefront because it's essentially, um, it, it's essentially a series of uh, storefronts, stores that are only the size of storefronts. And um, you can see them here at the base level of the kind of initial rendering. And uh, here, uh, this is this is the in the rendering the end of ritual, but this is the beginning of storefront. These there's a two different sizes. There's an eight by eight glass kind of vitrine, and then there's a twenty by eight glass vitrine. The idea with storefront is that we would curate every quarter a mixture of kind of cool young designers, or maybe a kind of global brand that has this kind of singular product, or a kind of local nonprofit and that those people end up being a kind of suite that are there potentially for the fall, and that those, why they're there actually kind of makes sense to kind of together. And that um, getting back to this idea of, of the content machine, every time you would kind of, the visitors would come to proxy, there would be different vendors. So there's, it's like the storefront's changing all the time, but it's actually, it's the store, it's the designer. Um, so this is a piece that we're, we're working on right now. Um, and also, we're working to get it done by the end of spring in 2013. And so once that piece goes in, it is, it's really proxy as this kind of idea of a content machine will really kind of be happening. And so again, the content diagram changing every quarter. So spring, summer. Uh, fall and winter are these different kind of clusters of like Mike and Micah are these great local designers, nice collective, they're super cool fashion designers in Dogpatch. So just bringing them, um, bringing people together that don't have stores of their own and, um, and, and kind of putting them together in a kind of curated mix. And then event play is this kind of space inside of a uh, storefront. Uh, there's an idea for a kind of outdoor movies that would happen. So this is a diagram of lot K. So outdoor movies that would happen on a screen or maybe like a mini golf that would be designed uh, by an artist or, or an architect that would be there for a season <clears throat> or just a public plaza of this kind of movable urban furniture. Um, or if there's a, a kind of organization that could fund a sort of more, a more permanent temporary theater or even a kind of tent construct to have a, a, a more enclosed kind of temporary theater. Um, or this kind of idea of urban beach, which is this kind of PS1 uh, shop architects kind of idea. So um, proxy as a construct is when, when we created proxy as a construct, we, we fully knew that it had this kind of short-term life to it. So we came up with this idea of here for now, uh, which is our motto. And it's really about kind of seizing the day that it's like the t clock is ticking. And in a way, it's, it's a kind of maybe a motto for us all that there's like, there's, there's not a lot of time and there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, and so we're, um, we tried to, to live uh, by this, and it kind of gives us this kind of sense of urgency about um, 
about what, what should come next. Um, and so um, I think I'm not going to show these. How am I for time? Five minutes? Yeah. So um, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about our kind of our multiple roles. And so um, our, our role in what is kind of great about Proxy is, is how it has really changed our office. And, you know, a lot of, uh, just listen, I didn't, I wasn't here in the morning, um, but I was really interested in this idea of, of a citizen architect. And I think that that's one of the really important things about, about Proxy and what it, what it has brought to our office is that it has brought this kind of sense of almost like urban leadership, that we are, in a way, urbanists. We are theorists about the city. But we're also really kind of just like engaged citizens, that we, we have taken it upon ourselves to take, to invest ourselves in a piece of the city and kind of try to make it great, even if it's just for a short time, that we are experimenting at full scale in real time, and it's 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 both exciting and incredibly scary. That because it's just like it's out there in the world. There's all the real world issues of people falling and wanting to sue you, um, and you know budgets and timelines and and complexities and and homeless people and all that kind of stuff. Um, it 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 has um, we have had to become fundraisers. We are um, business strategists. We're connectors. In many ways, that's a lot of what we're doing. We are connecting. We're connecting uh, vendors with the place. We're connecting neighbors with each other. We're connecting uh, the mayor's office more intimately with with the neighborhood because of our engagement with both. Um, and. Um, and I think that, and we're, I, th I mean, maybe more than anything, we're, we are risk takers. We have risked, we have kind of put ourselves out there and we are kind of risking like money and we took a loan to do this project from a client and we're, we're paying it back. But we saw the potential, the kind of huge potential. Um, and I think that people, people have gotten really excited about it. I think because of the economic downturn, it has become a story that actually has had pretty strong um, kind of uh, resonance with, with people. And I think that's why we were part of, of the US Pavilion, which is all about these kinds of projects, spontaneous interventions, um, and the kind of uh, the various awards that we've gotten. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. I was going to go through um, a series of precedents, but I think that there's not really enough time. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Do you, do you get any backlash from the community? Um, we, um, a little bit, but mostly on issues that are fairly mundane, uh, garbage is really the big issue. Um, people are concerned in an interesting way about garbage and its prol proliferation, where it comes from and why did it get there. So we've had to spend a lot of time like trying to solve garbage issues that may or may not be our issues um, in dealing with Recology, which is the San Francisco uh, recycling and, and garbage collection services, but also the Parks Department because they, they manage the park, which is right across from Proxy, and then Public Works, which actually has the garbage cans that are on public streets. So we're dealing now with multiple agencies, and we're like, well, what is the problem? How can we make it better? And in a way, just we haven't had to pay more. We've just had to like make people aware of the problem. And we got Recology to increase their pickup. And they're like, well, you're there. You're a real business. You've got, you know, you have your garbage service. And so they're, they were happy to work with us and to provide a kind of, you know, more stalwart uh, thing. But the neighbors, Hayes Valley is a really amazing neighborhood. Um, people here 
um, are very engaged in the process. They understand architecture. They understand city processes, uh, unlike any other neighborhood that we've ever done work in. And so a lot of them are planners or architects or are just engaged in, in the city in general. And so they actually asked for this kind of thing. And in our early, early, early meetings, everyone was just incredibly excited about the project. And they've been, they always have, they have concerns and, you know, there have been things that have been kind of put forward like, like, um, you know, after hours music or things like that, and we'll bring it to them. And they say, no, that's not appropriate. And we're like, okay, that's fine. And so there's just a real communication, the strong communication that we've built with the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Does this as as uh, built things make it more possible to do it? Uh, because I mean, it's kind of like people are doing this in guerrilla ways, like setting up markets. Yes. Yes. So um, I think that it does. I mean, we think about proxy as a framework, and so if the framework is there, meaning to the second question about does a physical presence promote? this idea of, of a content machine. I think that it does. Or like legitimize it. It's just, it's, it, maybe it legitimizes it or it collects it, it packages it a little bit. I think that it's also, um, we are creating a place and, and, and we are intentionally creating a place which is, which hopefully will be driven by this kind of sense of content change that people, it's, it's almost like creating serendipity, that people can go and they can be surprised by something. And so if they don't, if they, you know, serendipity also happens in the city and there are, you know, guerrilla things that are happening which are, are, are great, I think. Um, but I think when it's kind of coalesced together, it, they start to kind of affect each other. It's partly why we kind of had this mix of programs that we thought, it's like how do you create vibrancy of a place, it, I don't think it can just be one line of things or one, even one things. It's all these things that are happening at different times and kind of changing up. And then uh, on the first question, um, you know, I think that like the beer garden guys were not afraid of losing their lease. I mean, they're, the neighborhood loves them and it's, you know, even possible that the neighborhood will be really you know, up in arms when they have to go. But they were fully aware that there was a kind of time limit and they're very comfortable that, that we, we together could take their components and redeploy them on another site. I think it's the same with the art gallery. And so to, for me to think about the art gallery, sure it, it, it was like born in Hayes Valley, but what if it went into the mission or into Bay Point or other parts of the city or out in the middle of a field. It becomes a generator of all these kind of content, uh, uh, different content in different places. Chains? But well, that's a little bit of the nightmare, I think, is that if a developer, you know, we've been, we are the developer of this project, but we're really architects. I mean, our, our value and our ethic is really, yes, we're making money and we're sure, we're, we're making sure that we're not losing money and there's a lot of, lot of spreadsheets and lots of projections before we borrowed money from our client that we could pay it back and how that would happen. Um, but we're not really developers and I'm worried about this becoming almost an excuse. It's like, oh, at Proxy, they did it this way and it was great, but I think, you know, a, we pour a ton of time in our time kind of trying to make it great, trying to pick the right people, interviewing people, are they the right people to be there, do they get it, or are they just trying to, you know, make a buck or get, have cheap rent or something like that. So I am worried actually about the, the proliferation of it. It's like Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonian houses, you know. If you, if you repeat them all and you get rid of the details, there's just like, it just becomes a bunch of garbage and it changes the whole world. You know, suburbia, it just, you know, it, it can become a problem. So I think any idea can be bastardized. But I'm, that's a little bit my worry, is that it will become this thing of 
I think we, we need to put something on the website. It's like, don't try this. <laughs> don't try this at home, you know, because it's like, it's harder than you'd think, and it requires all of this. Almost like it requires a kind of stewardship that I think that many developers, and I don't want to disparage developers, all developers, because there are some great developers, but it, um, yeah, it could be misused. Yeah. So we're, yeah. So we're two years in uh, to a five-year lease. Um, it took a it took a full year to get through the building department and the planning department processes, um, and so really things have only been there for a year, year and a couple months. Um, the beer garden is actually just less than a year. Because uh, they 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 opened after Oktoberfest, after the beginning of Oktoberfest last year. Um, so for the redevelopment agency lot, which is um, lot K, the larger lot, um, the redevelopment agency doesn't exist anymore. Um, we have asked for a lease extension on that lot because there are no plans for that lot. Um, so we've asked for uh, from the city an an additional five years, which I think would actually allow many of these um, you know, conceptual ideas to actually have time to take root. Um, the, the clock ticks very quickly. Um, so the answer is yes. I think on lot uh, L, where the beer garden is, I think that that will not have uh, get a lease extension. But I'm not, it's not 100% sure. Maybe a final question. Um, Mm -hmm. Are you are you a developer? No, but I remember reading an article about some architects in San Diego, like Jonathan Siegel and Ted Smith, mm -hmm. um, who became developers because they felt frustrated with the inability of the client to understand their vision or to trust them with the vision. So I want to kind of turn it around, and maybe the problem isn't that developers are going to take your idea and bastardize it. Yeah, well, I completely agree with you. And um, we, um, we are essentially moving the multifamily housing project that we're working on together, and we're on the development team. I mean, there are partners, and there's you know lots of, there's people that have more money than we do. It's mostly our sweat equity in that, in that deal. Um, but we put that team together because we wanted to put, to put together trusted people that we could work with that would have our same values that would listen to us and we could take more control. And so for proxy, we, we, we see the potential of proxy actually being a deployable strategy that we would take forward. And so right now we're investigating the process of uh, creating a 501c3 that would be this kind of mechanism for both kind of receiving placemaking grants but, but being a way in which the, the, the organization could go into many places. And actually, because, because we are architects, we have the tools to, uh, to visualize what, what could happen, to listen well to, the, to either the actual place or the neighbors, to, um, and then to, to actually get it built, to, see, to, get, to go through the whole you know, entitlements process. And so we know all of these parts. So I, the short answer is I completely agree that that's what should happen. From a liability insurance standpoint, they don't like it at all because they see it as kind of competing interests that you have your hand in two pies. But it's much more why we're looking at a 501c3 is it really is this kind of nonprofit kind of sense that it's more of like deploying a strategy than development per se. It's like redefining development, or it's a certain kind of development. 
So uh, yes. Okay, thank you.